My name is Barbara. I'm a park ranger at Monocacy National Battlefield. And this weekend, July 9th and 10th, we are commemorating the 147th anniversary of the Battle of Monocacy. The battle took place on July 9th, 1864. And we have many different activities going on this weekend. Uh, the one that's upcoming next is at one o'clock, we will have an artillery firing demonstration. And if you come out, we have an all volunteer crew. They are portraying a Confederate artillery battle, that, a battery that fought here at the Battle of Monocacy. And they will be going through all the steps that it took to load and fire these weapons and uh, how artillery was used at the Battle of Monocacy. We also have archaeologists out today uh, until about two o'clock and they are working at the site of a slave village on the best farm which is also part of the battlefield so we have an encampment and artillery firing demonstrations there's a lot to see and do here at Monocacy National Battlefield so please come on out at the beginning of the Civil War the United States government had essentially just adopted a a rifle musket as a standard arm across its regiments. Prior to that, what would happen is your standard regiment would usually have a flank company that was organized as skirmishers. They fought in a loose open order. And those gentlemen would actually be equipped with a rifle and generally not a bayonet, just a rifle. The other companies in the regiment would be considered heavy infantry and they would be equipped with a smoothbore musket, generally a 69 caliber size. Uh, they were long, uh, the barrel ran anywhere from like 35, 36, 37 inches long. The rifles would be maybe 32, 33. Um, just before the Civil War in 1855, when the idea of, of firing rifled projectiles became fairly common, the United States federal government uh, adopted the model uh, rifle musket of 1855 which was a rifle weapon obviously by the name but it had the long barrel which is why they call it rifle musket and basically that was replacing the 69 cal. However what was going on at the time of the war that had just been introduced uh, maybe a couple years before um, those rifles were not well distributed there were very few of them that had been provided to the states under the Militia Act of 1808 and so there are very few of them when the southern states seceded they may have gotten some um, there may have been some purchased by private militias up in the north. So basically when the war started, most of the troops were still equipped with what you might consider to be outdated smoothbore weapons. Um, the most famous federal rifle musket was the Model 1861 Springfield, which if you had two to compare and looked at an 1855 versus an 1861, the 1861 is nothing more than a simplified version of the 1855. Um, both sides, because of the rapid increase, obviously, both in the federal government, which had a small standing army, and of course the Confederates, which were raising armies from scratch, there was a, an immediate need for large amounts of weapons. So one of the first thing that was done was the, both the federal government and Confederate government sent purchasing agents over to Europe, and they basically were purchasing any kind of arm that was offered for sale. One of the better quality ones, uh, on par, if not some would argue superior to the standard federal 1855 or 1861 was the Enfield. Here is a two-band version, the rifle version of this. This is actually an 1858 model. These are rifled. These were purchased both in this and with the, the standard rifle musket three-band length for, for troops. Both, both the federal government and northern states, southern states, and the Confederacy purchased these in very large numbers probably close to almost half a million per side. And these were uh, well, generally of, of high, well quality, um, basically equivalent uh, in caliber to the standard federal, which is .58. These are both in .577 caliber. So to a certain degree, the ammunition could basically so be So they would have been made order. overseas, actually? Yes, these would have been made overseas. There was one commercial company uh, that was making copies uh, of Enfield style mm -hmm. rifle muskets. But almost all of these would come from overseas. Mm -hmm. Obviously the Union was buying them, the Confederacy was buying them, and they were coming in through the blockade in very large numbers. Mm -hmm. This 1853 three-band model was probably by mid-war the standard Confederate rifle musket, standard mm -hmm. weapon in the Confederacy. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Junior Ranger. Hello. Good afternoon. Yay. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to Monocacy National Battlefield. Who's been here before? All right. All right. That's a decent show of hands. Has anybody been out to the archaeology yet? No? A couple hands? Oh, my. Well, let me encourage you. They will be out there until 3 o'clock on the Best Farm. They are excavating a slave village out there, and it is fascinating stuff. So I would encourage anyone who's not been out there to go out and learn about the project. They start cleaning up at 3 o'clock, so you still have time to go out there. This weekend, we are commemorating our battle anniversary. This is a battle that occurred on July 9th, 1864. So we're just a day late, but yesterday actually was the battle anniversary. So that was kind of nice to uh, commemorate it on the actual day um, of the battle. So what we're gonna be doing with this program is an artillery demonstration. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the battle. I will probably condense it a little bit because it is sweltering hot. And I know you came to hear a big boom. So, I will give you a little bit of background on the battle and why we're here. And then yep. this nice gentleman right here is going to give you some information about the different positions of artillery. And then they will be firing the artillery. When they fire the artillery, we will let you know. And at that time, we suggest that if you have small children, large children who easily frighten animals, that you grab hold of them, hold them tight lest they get scared. Also, if you have any hearing aids or hearing devices, uh, we recommend that you turn them down or turn them off. It can cause uh, some interference for you. So, why are we here to commemorate Monocacy National Battlefield? This is a battle that took place in the third year of the war. It was at a time when morale in the North was extremely low. It was Union General Grant's first summer east Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men were dying as he made his way into Virginia. This is a different type of warfare than what people were used to in the war. And they were not happy. It is also an election year. And at this point in the war, Lincoln did not think he was going to be reelected. He was fairly certain of that at that time. So it is politically a critical moment. Grant had made his way into Virginia. He's battling it out with Lee, trying to get to Petersburg and then, of course, onto the Confederate capital of Richmond. He had taken reinforcements out of the forts surrounding Washington. Throughout the war, there's a series of forts that go around the city to protect it in case there's a threat on the nation's capital. He did not feel as though there was going to be a threat on the nation's capital, so he left it virtually empty. And he would have those men reinforce the Union forces in Virginia. Lee knew it. He knew that there were now more forces against his Confederate forces and that the forts in Washington were empty. It's a lot of alliteration, a lot of F's going on. Everybody keep up your tongue twisters. So what happened is Lee made a pretty bold move. He decided to have a Confederate force that was already in the Shenandoah Valley continue to go uh, up the Shenandoah Valley, or as we say, down the Shenandoah Valley, because the river actually travels north. And so we say you're going down the valley when in fact you're going north. He would continue to go down the valley and into Maryland and pretty much be undetected because Union Command expected Early's army to return to Virginia once they had accomplished their, pur their purpose which was to get rid of Union General Hunter. But instead of returning to Lee, they continue, and they go through Maryland and make it all the way to Frederick without really having much uh, in the way of anyone to stop them. In fact, Union Command was still not convinced that it was Early's army in Maryland. It was the president of the railroad who contacted Lew Wallace, who was in command of the third, who was in command in Baltimore, and he would have with him 1,500 100-day men. So these guys have signed up for 100 days. They're given uniforms and they're trained, but typically they're just going to be doing guard duty, protecting areas such as the, the Monocacy Junction, the Railroad Junction. And uh, instead, they're going to come here. 
They're going to skirmish for about two days on the west side of Frederick while General Early and his men were making their way over the Catoctins. Wallace is going to try to decide where exactly Early is headed. So trying to get into Pennsylvania, trying to take the most direct route to Washington, which is the Georgetown Pike, 355 out here, or head to Baltimore and then down to Washington. <coughs> By the end of those two days, he has figured out that Early is in, in fact going to try to take the most direct route to Washington, get there as quickly as he can and he knows that he needs to delay him as long as possible. He gets word to Grant he needs reinforcements. Those reinforcements will be sent. He gets about 3,000 troops, 3rd Division of 6th Corps. They are arriving here on trains up until the night before the battle. So the day of the battle, July 9th, Wallace ends up with somewhere around 6,000 troops facing approximately 12 to 15,000 Confederates. Outmanned and outgunned, the Union have with them six pieces of artillery. When they arrive, there's two pieces of artillery already here. One has no ammunition, the other they used in the morning, and then someone loaded it backwards. So they couldn't use it the rest of the day. The Confederates have with them upwards of 24 pieces of artillery. So they are definitely outgunned as well. The battle will go on here until about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Basically, Wallace makes a defense on this side of the river and is trying to delay them as long as he can from getting across. But by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he knows that he did what he came here to do, which is delay early, make him at least spend the night, give time to Grant to move reinforcements back into Washington. And that's what he accomplished. The next day, the Confederates will be on their way to Washington. They will skirmish outside of Fort Stevens, but at that point, Early knows that the rest of the 6th Corps, the 1st and 2nd Divisions, have arrived and he is not going to get into the city. So at the end of the day, what does it all mean? Well, for the Union, tactically, this is a loss. But they knew they were going to lose when they came here. This is a surprise campaign. They had no idea that a Confederate Army was going to be marching through here, much less trying to take the capital. So in that sense, Lew Wallace saved the day here. And this becomes known as the battle that saved Washington.